So hello everybody and welcome to the Reuse Company webinars. Uh, you will be muted during the webinar, but if you have any question or comment, uh, you can use the chat box, but please address your comments to the Reuse Company and not to the presenter. If you have any technical issues, you can use the chat box or send an email to support at reusecompany.com. The webinar will be recorded and in a few days, we will send you the consequent link. Today's topic is about the requirements authoring tool, Red for Capella, the perfect way for working with both models and textual requirements. My name is Jose Pereira, and I will be hosting today's webinar. With me, I have my colleague, Christoph Froling, and he will do the presentation about Red for Capella. This is the agenda for the webinar. First, we will have a, de a description of the company and the presenter. Then Krista will talk about the complexity of SE. Next, we will take a look at the Capella modeling tool. And after that, we will see the Red for Capella tool. Finally, we will have some, some time for questions and answers. So let's start with a few words uh, about the Reuse Company. The Reuse Company was created in 1999 as a spin-off from the university from a university in Madrid by system and software engineers. Our headquarters are in Madrid, but we also have an office in Stockholm, Sweden, and a delegation in Tokyo, Japan. In 2021, we are planning to open an office in the US. Our mission is to promote every usable, scalable, and global solution to smart and interoperable systems engineering environment, and we do this by offering a semantic knowledge centric approach. The Reuse Company is also called TRC, and we would like, it, we would like to say it as um, it's easy to remember if you think the T as in traceability, R like in reuse, and C or almost Q like in quality. Now, let me introduce you to our presenter. Christo is from Sweden, and he is the CEO of the Reuse Company in Scandinavia. He has over two decades of experience in successful implementation of systems engineering and its subdiscipline. He has been working both with development of advanced technical systems and with public organizations in the specification and procurement of complex infrastructure projects. Christer is one of our principal consultants and is specializing in applying SE and designing thinking into uh, organizations willing to adopt change and implement a knowledge-driven and lean SE approach focusing on information quality, knowledge buildup and reuse with the passion of coaching others. He is also an appreciated lecturer, teacher, and a strong believer in knowledge sharing and networking. To start with today's topic, hello, Christo. Please tell us about Red for Capella. Okay. Thank you very much for that lovely presentation. So let's start off by talking a little bit on the complexity of systems engineering. First of all, I, I want to, to say that since, since you already saw that I have 20 years of experience, I have absolutely started off my career with writing requirements, reading requirements, reading a lot of texts. And for me, it's, it's hard to figure a world without text. And even if we say usually that a uh, picture may absolutely be worth a thousands of words, it's most likely that that you agree with me that if you want to have that precision, that crispiness that we all look for, we need to have text. It's I have a hard time understanding or believing that we will go ahead and, and skip uh, uh, written text in the future, but we will have to see. And when it comes to, to models, it's of course, also interesting to compare models with text and we will talk more about that in this webinar but to be honest our brains themselves think in pictures so of course we love to draw pictures we love to draw models we love to understand concepts and complexity by by drawing things and these two combined i think will be the the solution. And we have been struggling for, for decades now to understand how we could manage to, to combine and interact between the textual world and the modeling world and the modeling community. And I'm the advocate of us trying to, to work together. 
and figure out how we can make this this fit in in the in a good way and this is one attempt from us to to do just exactly that if we take a little little other different approach when it comes to to uh, text and, and modeling, we can look at, the, at different system engineering processes and practices. And one of these are the 21110 for systems and software engineering. It's a basic 15288 uh, model for, for uh, systems engineering, but it's tailored for smaller enterprises. And I like this because it's, it's very suitable for, for this topic of today. So if we start to look into to a model like this, uh, we see that we have a, a, a strong leg in people like requirements engineers working with requirements. They elicit the requirements from the need side, they analyze the system context, perhaps that's a, a model, and they, have, and they verify the, the stakeholder requirements and they validate the content with them and so on and so forth. Basic systems engineering, nothing strange there. And perhaps they have a tool. And for the sake of this demo, uh, I'm saying that they have IBM DOORS tools. And I must say that there are plenty of other tools out there. So uh, please don't think that I'm an, an advocate for IBM DOORS. But for this demo, I think IBM DOORS could be a good example for us. And then, of course, we probably have another discipline, which is system architects. And the system architects, they have a different focus. They are looking into the context. They are looking into different aspects of the system. They are looking into functionality, into, into modes and states, and so on and so forth. And they are probably drawing up both logical and, and physical structures. And that's very good. And in this example, we of course want them to use the, the Capella modeling uh, environment. And that's it's a brilliant uh, piece of, of tool, I, I must say. So let's say that this is the scene for us. And if we now look into this, this process, we see that People do reviews. That's the typical uh, way of, of examining the requirements you have been writing to do this verification and validation of the content in it. Fair enough. But my experience tells me that the, the actual reviewing of the content is performed very closely to the source. And many tools, they actually have that built in. So you can, you can review and comment the requirements in the requirements management tool. So it tends to be a quite isolated approach. And I would say that the same goes for, for reviewing models and the model content. It also quickly becomes an isolated event, which means that we tend to have a problem here to make this correct, complete, and consistent when we hopefully think that these persons, these developers, the ones receiving the modeling content and the requirements, that they get the complete picture and that they get the same picture that we draw up in the first place. And if that doesn't happen, we soon start to get a lot of questions and a lot of doubts and a lot of insecurity and a lot of misguided efforts, which means that at the end of the day, we might end up in an environment where we actually are incomplete and inconsistent. And I will also like to add here that, that I'm not a true believer in, in any waterfall model. I must say that this, this is just taking out of, the, of its context. We need to understand that, that all of these approaches are very recursive and very iterative to, to their approach. But the end, at the end of the day, for the, for the purpose of the requirements and the models, you always need to be complete at that point in time. Otherwise, people start to do silly stuff. So when you come to this conclusion that you actually are inconsistent, then you'll have problems. 
because you have spent money on useless things, you need to do rework, you do to you need to do re-engineering, and you will lose time. At the end of the day, the, the management team, the project managers might see that, that the cost is, is really rising. And I must say that by finding errors in their sources, in their res respective sources, in the requirements or in the models early, that's the source of, of not ending up in this situation. And I've been mentioning these concepts a little bit, and I will drill down for you some more when it comes to correctness, consistency, and completeness. What is that? Those of you who, who has been part of our webinars before, you know this, and perhaps, but perhaps some of you haven't heard this before. So let's let's take it quickly. Correctness can occur on individual requirements and or model elements. One of those can, can be correct or incorrect when it comes to the shape and the content. Okay, fair enough. But when it comes to completeness and consistency, then you need to look on, on a set of requirements or a set of a model or actually a set of requirements compared to a model to see is this correct, is this complete or is it do we have any inconsistency? And this is hard. This is the hardest thing you can do. And it's super hard when you think that you need to compare information written in, in natural language, say English, to a model written in another language in another tool. How hard is it to verify and validate that, the, that you aren't having any inconsistency and, and any incompleteness? And we have developed this practice for, for over a decade now when it comes to uh, looking into to content like requirements. And when it comes to, for instance, this is an, an example of, of different techniques and different approaches to verify the, the correctness of the content, we can both look into the, the modeling to, oh, sorry, the requirements management tool itself to look for missing links, missing attributes, uh, in, uh, that you have the wrong versions of things. That's a good thing to do. Basically making sure that, that you are following a require, the requirements management practice that you have, have set up. If we then move down a little bit to look into the content, we are basing a lot of our metrics, because this is metric based, you can tailor this to your need, on the INCOSA guide. So the tailorization is, is of course important so you don't measure yourself to death. But there are a lot of measurements for forbidden wor words, for vagueness, for, for uh, that you are not fulfilling mandatory things like having a shell in the requirements and so on and so forth. So that's that's the basics. Then we can be more advanced and look for for the readability of things with misspelling, with text length, with punctuations, detecting passive voice. Uh, errors shall be logged is of course a requirement, but you are not saying what is logging the, the error and what is actually the error. So it's, it's, it's a quite useless requirement. So detecting those is of course important for us to, to be, be as crisp and precise as possible. And then we can, can actually create those metrics based on conformance with models. So if we, for instance, have a product break, breakdown structure or a functional breakdown structure, and this is just examples of those, if you have those, and, and now you have to think that you actually have that in the Capella tool, why don't you use that to check for, for these things? Are you correct? Are you using the, the naming convention that you have set up in the, in the model? And then we will talk a little bit more on, on patterns later on. But patterns, which is basically a semantic structure uh, which guides the syntax of your requirement or, or any, any piece of, of text, basically, you can use that for both guiding the writings, writing of the requirements or for checking that you are, you are fulfilling things uh, as you have set up. Like passive voice is a good thing to measure with a, with a uh, pattern. But enough of this. Just some examples also for, for completeness. 
And this is an example just to, to show you the basics of this. Now you have to imagine that, that these are a set of requirements in the, in the gray box here. We have a state chart which shows the different modes and states of this piece of PC uh, computer. And this is a picture of, uh, or a model of the product breakdown structure. If we just go through and try to compare these, these two environments, the written requirements with the models, what happens? Okay, we can check that we are mentioning a computer. That's good. We're mentioning monitors. Okay, fine. So this is based on semantics now. We are checking that we are using the, the terms that we actually have in the model. That's good. So we can say that we can do this thick ticking off basically. Fine. So we can say that we have we have mentioned and talked about these things in the requirements. Okay, fine. But what does it also tell us? It, yeah, it actually tells us that we are not done. We are not complete. Even if the requirements per se, the ones we see here are good, we're not done. Perhaps we are lacking something, or perhaps we are at that point in the development chain that we can release this version because we have mentioned everything that needs to be mentioned for the work that needs to be done. But this is a good sanity check that we, we are not missing out anything. Because engineers are clever, they they will work regardless. They will do the, they will do their work regardless if they are if they have requirements or not. I would say. The same goes for consistency. But now we can be a little bit more clever. It's we have the same requirements, the same models. We can check that with that the, the the computer is is fine. But we can also see that this requirement, the computer shall have two USB ports, isn't consistent with the model because the model doesn't mention any anything about a USB port. And we can continue. But here we also find an error because we are saying that that we should we should be able to transition from hibernate to off state and it isn't mentioned at all uh, like that in, in the in the state diagram. And we will see that uh, actually as, as one of the points in the demo. So this is a little bit more clever. While the, the completeness things looks for the coverage, here we are looking that we actually are, are, are using the, the right types of relationships. So this is inconsistent. So these two combined will, will absolutely give you more information on the quality of your work. And I've been talking a little bit about, about patterns, because pattern-based writing of requirements of any text basically that you want to, to keep under control is, is the key here. And if we start off by having patterns, then we can start to, to use the patterns and compare the text following the patterns with, for, for instance, models. So we can make sure that we have the, the naming consistency in place. Are we talking about a video card? Then we sh in the model, then that piece of equipment should be called video card in the requirement, nothing else. And it's super easy to actually start to, to mix things, add synonyms, add versions, variants. You do cut and paste from another project. Suddenly you have, you, you have two very similar terms, but they are there are they the same or not? And the same goes for, for keeping the, the text consistent with the models. And the interesting thing, which we also will see when we are using the technique to, to write based on patterns, and we are using the technique to, to connect the patterns to the model content, we can ac actually start to look for overlapping requirements. And that's that's a very interesting thing also, which is absolutely not done, I would say. You will not find overlapping requirements using regular requirements reviews where you read the requirements as text. We are not we are not wired uh, in, in that way in our brains. So so this is a good technique to find that we actually are are or have overlaps or that we actually are over specifying things. And just a, a brief picture, if, if this, 
this uh, shows us how one of those patterns can look like and of course patterns can be tailored to your need they must be because we are not telling you exactly how you should you write your requirements there are different sources like sophist and airs that has that can provide us with out of the box patterns we have those uh, freely downloadable from our web if you want to start with those but if if we have this structure of a requirement why don't connect these slots to the the actual content of the of the model so that we actually don't do any any mistakes that's that's the beauty of it so that's that's of course what we what we want to encourage you to do okay i understand this i understand that we need to to keep uh, the quality up and so on and so forth but the connection now we have to establish some kind of connection between the requirement side and the modeling side. And it needs to be consistent and robust and it needs to be easy to work with. That's, we understand those things. And if you have good quality in the requirements, do you automatically then get good quality in the models? No, you don't. So you need to be able to both work in isolation and both starts to to compare those uh, and make sure that you you, you actually have the, the quality that you need on on both sides or in both environments I should say and also another thing which is really something that we need to start think on when we do this what is the truth if you write something in the requirement, is that the truth that should guide the model? Or should the model always guide the requirement? And I must say that this is something that we need, need to decide and, and keep under control because it can't be floating because then we will synchronize back and forth and people will, will just change. So some, something needs to be the master and some, something needs to be, uh, you can call it the slave, that receives that kind of information. And with this possibility to use patterns, we have the possibility to say, for this slot, in this position, the model is the master. You can write whatever, but if you break the pattern, you're breaking the model. And then you have to com confirm that the model needs to be updated or that you actually have, well, had a, a wrong idea in your head, basically. So when we have this set, set up, we can start the wheel to turn the wheel of, of quality, which means that by, by starting to look more into the quality and start to, to do this pattern-based writing, we can start to, to you know, compare it with the models, looking for inconsistency. And if we also get this, this degree of usability that that we actually get people from from the from the uh, architecting environment and community to actually be concerned about the requirements and vice versa we we will start this what we call the requirement round trip which, which will make it the, our lives much much eas easier and better in in the long run that we will ensure completeness correctness and consistency in our work products because at the end of the day that will spill over to, to the product we are actually interested in, the system we are designing and building. So a few words on the Capella modeling tool. This is not a web webinar on the Capella modeling tool. So I just want to mention that Capella is an open source solution for model-based system engineering. If you go to this, this web page, you have more information, you have written information, you have content like, like videos, you can, you can download uh, Capella, Eclipse Capella, and it's ready to run. And it's filled with, with one demo project, so you can start up and see how it works. And, and, and there are also books to buy if you want to learn more about the, the Capella modeling technique. And I think it's a lovely tool. I must say that congratulations to all of you that's involved in, in building this, this for us. It's a, it's a beautiful tool. But that's that. Now over to the rat for Capella. 
what are the main capabilities of, of that? Yeah, the, the RAT tool itself is, is part of the, our systems engineering suite, which besides having a, a big focus on, on the authoring side, we also have tools for, for uh, setting up these quality baselines, as assessing quality uh, over a, a big, big chunk of requirements and, and do that. And we can manage the verification validation part of, of any system engineering effort. We have had a webinar recently on the traceability studio where we can trace different sources and, and start to compare them regardless on, on in what shape and format they are. And we have the knowledge manager. I will mention, I will talk a little bit about the knowledge manager before I show some, some demoing for you because we have that in the backbone. That keeps the vocabulary, that keeps the pattern. It's, it does the natural language processing and it's actually the brain in our system. But we will focus on RAT and we will focus a little bit on, on KM, not the other tools today. And I found this picture on, on the web. And I, I think it's fine, it's nice because those of you who have been working as systems in air for a while, you, you agree with me that the, the regular and the, the, the way people tend to use if they have not slided over more and more to, to model-based systems engineering is that the requirements are actually the interface to, to the customer or to our other stakeholders. So for decades, we have been focusing a lot on requirements and requirements management and requirements engineering. And for this demo, we are using IBM doors. And now more and more uh, over a period of time, people are doing more and more modeling because our, our techniques uh, provides a, a great opportunity for us to, to add that those pieces of, of information that really show us how we can manage with the com uh, complexity and, and things like that. So modeling is, is growing. But you see the, the arrows here back and forth where, where you have to trace information, you have, where you have to share information. And this is not easy to do. And we, we, I will show you where we actually are managing and working with, with the information, both in, in the requirements world and in the model itself using the, the RAT tool. And we will have the, the KM as the brain in the background. And I will not talk any, any more about the traceability studio, but if you're interested in tracing and looking for, for those type of things, I can recommend a webinar on, on YouTube on that, that we had recently. I think it was a couple of weeks ago. So the main things about RAT for Capella it that is that it's we are managing to connect to many different sources of information. In this, this demo, you will see that we connect to both IBM doors and the Capella model. And, and the editing part is, is of course, the, the, the important thing. Uh, many tools, both like Capella and, and IBM doors, completely lacks the, the, the editing functionality. Um, so you ha will have a, a good, portion of inline uh, assistance, a good portion of, of help actually when you try to, to edit uh, your requirements. And you will, be, you will see that you can base it on, on patterns. And the, and the window uh, itself in the editor is very easy to set up so that you actually see just the information that you personally want to see. So I think that's also a beautiful thing for us. And the quality. As I said, it's based on the knowledge we have. We are using an ontology in the background. We are setting up these smart rules for correctness, completeness, and consistency. And we will of sure, for sure, ensure that, that we will have that we will keep this naming consistency in place. And we will look a little bit more on this uh, synchronization aspects and the data management uh, itself so that we can ensure that we can we can perform this requirements round trip that I was talking about. So these are the, the main things uh, about the RAT for Capella, I would say. A few words on Knowledge Manager or KM, and that's the tool that works with our ontology, the knowledge base. Basically, 
without saying so much about this, uh, you can find uh, knowledge management webinars on, on our YouTube page, is that it holds the vocabulary. It also holds um, the, the architecture, the, the knowledge architecture, and that's where we want to link it to the model itself, so that we actually understand each other, you could say. It also holds all the patterns, and when we have those first three things in place, we can start to formalize, we can start to, to with our own representation language inside the tool, you don't have to bother about that, we will be able to start to reason about things like in, incompleteness and inconsistency. When you go for our tools, you, can, you will see that, th that you have many different downloadable ontologies from the web, free, free of charge, of course. So you can choose your, your, your language because they are all based on, on the language. So regardless if you work in, in Japanese, Swedish, Dutch, German, Italian, French, or English or Spanish, you can download one or all of these and connect it to KM to start to work with. Our demo will be in English, so we will use the, an English database. And basically what, what KM does is, is to manage knowledge. You will have a generic English side, which, which is the, the thing you get when you download the, the ontology in the first place. It includes language, it includes terms, it includes some uh, uh, context models like like clusters with with the same type of words and things but what you need to understand and and figure out by yourself is how much of your domain specific language and your relationships uh, is needed uh, and that depends on what you want to check so you don't have to pour everything you have in your organization into this, this tool, but you have to figure out what is your pain points, what do you want to check, and then add that information so you can actually check that. And you see here by the graphs that we are already indicating that, that if you have something in the shape of models, we are of course interested in using that information. We will keep the patterns. I will not drill down anymore into patterns. And well, when we have this, we can start to formalize and we can start to reason about what we actually are, are working with. So this, these things are actually the, the ones that overbridge going back and forth between written text and models. So we are using basically our techniques in the middle to, to compare the one side with the other and, and back and forth. And, and especially for consistency and completeness uh, analysis. So when you want to set up this knowledge interface to Capella, because I do urge you to, to understand that you don't have to put things manually into the, the KM, the ontology, you can, you can just tap into it. So if you have the knowledge manager and you have your ontology, let's say it's the English one for, for this, this purpose, you go into KM, you select that you want to add a knowledge interface. You say that you, you are, the knowledge interface is of the type Capella. You select where you have the, the Capella database, where you have the model itself. And then you, you are setting up uh, the representation language. What, what is the information that you want to have in KM? And here you can select all as, as I've been doing for this demo, or you can deselect things which you are not interested in. And these are read from, from the, the Capella model. So these are the things in this uh, presentation that, that I've actually imported uh, in, into the model. So say say uh, so by saying that I can also say that this is this is not a seamless maneuver. If you update something in the Capella tool uh, and you store it, if you have KM open and you're working, you have to reload this connection. But many many times it it manages itself because you will do this and the next time you will start up the tool then it will reload automatically but if you have everything open you need to remember that this is not a seamless maneuver you have to make sure that the, the information is updated but at, at the end of the day what we want to see is that things in the in the model can be represented in km 
So if I have a physical breakdown in the model, I want to have the physical breakdown in the tool. And just these small black, I don't think, I don't know what it is. I think it's USB sticks or something. It should re represent that this is a read-only thing. You can't, you can't update the control system. You, only, you can't update the management system here because that's that's kept uh, within this this model. Okay. And if we now think that Capella is the t the tool we want to use, of course we want to tap into that. But we have to remember just briefly that it's it's very likely that you have many other sources of inf information. And basically what we want to do with KM is to create connectors to as many tools as possible, which you might be want to use in your knowledge base. So basically we are sucking in that information into the knowledge base. And we also want to do that with Capella, of course. So therefore the Capella model has a, a lot of connectivity and also the DOORS tools has, has uh, much connectivity and especially uh, when it comes to requirements uh, authoring, okay? And we need to look also into the synchronization aspects. And as I've been showing you, ca to capture vocabulary can also be done by connecting the Capella model to, to KM. So by saying that, I want to go over for some demoing. The first use case I want to show you is how to you how you can write new requirements in the Capella using RAT. And the sequence is that we will write new requirements in Capella. We will allocate requirements links because you can graphically show uh, how your requirement is is linked to an element. We will open the RAT editor and save the requirements, and we will write the new requirements using a pattern. So let's go for it. We have created in this case uh, our own model called the temperature war. It includes a logical structure and a physical architecture. So in this case, we have created a Capella module for storing the, the requirements. So typically you do like this, you add a requirement, you have to put this out of your way so you, you see where you are. Yeah, and you start to, to type. And you have to make sure that you have the naming consistent here, the control system. Yeah, we have a control system. Must, now I changed my mind, be equipped with a fast and reliable time controller. Yeah. And we are finished. And now we have the possibility that you have written that requirement to show it in the model itself. So you do it like this. Yeah, now we can see it. And you have the possibility also to link the requirement to the actual model itself to the elements in the model you are interested in showing that you are talking about basically. So here I create the links. Yep. Looking good. Now I have two requirements. And now I want to show you how you could actually edit this requirement. So here you have the rat for Capella. So it's inside the, the Capella environment. And we, we press edit. And now you get the editor. And you see that you have a lot of information in here. And you can, as I said, here you on the right side, you see that, that we are actually breaking a couple of, of rules we have set up. 
you can see down to the left that we are are breaking two rules and we are applying to a, a set of other rules which makes this requirement quite okay anyway so one is is that it's misspelled but first of all i want to detect the model elements in text so i will create those links automatically so here i've created a link to the control system but I can't create the link to the to time controller because it's misspelled. Okay, now I solved that problem. I still have some, some vagueness in the requirement, but anyway, I don't care about this right now. So now I have, have the time controller and the control system in there. So now I'm, I'm happy and I save. And I don't know if you saw that, but it also changed the link itself because I, I did an error here because I first linked it to the temperature controller and not the time controller. So now it, it automatically updated that one. And that's that's quite a cool, cool feature. Okay. The next thing I want to do is to add a requirement, but not using this one. I will go down. I will select create a new requirement in the RAT. I will open up the, the editor. And for this purpose, I will use a pattern. And we have we have created a set of patterns and I will use it as a, a fairly simple one, basically saying that, that we should have a system element, we sh it should have a shell, it should have a, the verb have, then it should say a number or an infinite article, a uh, un, and then a system name again. And you see that we have created the relationships down here that these systems actually needs to be part of the PBS. Okay, so let's start. We start with the, and then we should have, and here you have all the, the component component names. And you see that it creates the links automatically now for us. Now we should have a, a number or a, a, a un. So let's say a for, for this purpose. And again, we should choose a, an, a, an element. A temperature controller. Yeah, fine. And here I have high quality compared to the, the, the setup I have for, for checking the quality. And I can show that requirement as well in the model. And the links I will, I will get uh, immediately. Okay, so that was actually the the first I wanted to show you. Of course, you, you shouldn't forget to save. And the next one actually is to use the rat grid. The rat grid is the possibility to view all the requirements in the module. So I will open up the grid. I will view all the requirements. I will do some editing. And we will look into something fishy. We will look into, have we found an overlapping inconsistent requirement or not? And we will save this in, in Capella again. So let's see how this looks like. Now I have a, a set of requirements or a set, at least three, we can call that a set. So of course I can open them one, one by one, or I can use the RAT grid, show requirements in grid. And here we suddenly see all the requirements we have in the system requirements module. So all of those requirements can be seen here. They are indicated to be three star requirements, all of them. We can edit or we can create or we can remove requirement in this view, or we can use the technique to actually paste in requirements from, from outside or, or extract information using patterns. But we will look into that some other time. So we can click it and we open up the same editor. Here the requirement is, is good, but I see that I've written with a fast, a reliable. 
of course that's English, but it's not good English. So let's get rid of two here, uh, the two vagueness. I just keep one. And I need to think on what what is the reliability here I want to capture. But for now, it's this is this is okay for the for the demo. Yeah, I want to save it, and I I come to the next requirement. This one I haven't checked at all. The requirement quality is good, but now I also add the link. I want to save it. I go to the next one. And this was, one is fine. But you see here that we are checking correctness. We can also check consistency and completeness. And look here, the similar, similar requirement is, is quite interesting because we, we actually indicate that, that the requirement we have up here is actually 50% equal to, to the, another requirement. The only difference is that this requirements talk about the time controller and this one about the temperature controller. So of course we can say that that by checking that actually I will we will come back a little bit. Yeah here. Um, this this makes it uh, actually possible for us to to assess uh, are the requirements overlapping and things like that to to just figure that out. Uh, I see that I don't have so much more time, but that's a, a semantic uh, test we are doing when we are looking into into the requirements. Are they overlapping or not? Okay. The the third demoing is to detect a wrong transition. So we will look into a transition diagram uh, in Capella. We will uh, create a new requirement. We will sh see that the rat indicates that we have a wrong, wrong uh, state transition. Uh, and we can see how we can, can fix that problem. So let's go for that one. Here's the state chart. And we can we can go from configuration mode to validation mode to ready mode to combat mode, and so on and so forth, according to the model. So here we have created. Here we want to create a new requirement, and we have here for the sake of this demoing, we have uh, created a pattern just showing that a system element can tra transit from one state to another. So it's a very simple pattern. The temperature warrior shall transit from configuration mode to ready mode. But look here, we can actually indicate that, that we are doing an invalid state transition because we are not consistent with the actual model itself. But let's save it and see what happens. Because of course, if we want to show that in the model, it, it become, becomes quite obvious what we are talking about. So let's put it in the model. And you can see here that, that the requirements, even if it's, if, if it's good, if the content is good, it's not correct. And it's inconsistent with the model because it describes that you actually can transit from configuration mode to ready mode. And that's not according to the model. So let's see what happens if we create that transition in the model this time, because the requirement is correct according to us. So let's save it. And now we need to update. We need to update the the ontology. So we need to read re-enter re, re the information from from the changes we did in the model. And now if we open up the requirement again. And by the way, you can also open up it up with the buttons up in the pane there. You will see that it actually correct this time. Because now we changed the model and it it's actually in line with the requirement itself. So that was a thing I wanted to show you. And the last thing is to show you how the synchronization works. As I said in, in the, the first part of this, we must make sure that the, the information is consistent in the doors and in the Capella side. So what I want to do is that I would want to show you how I start the RAT synchronizer. 
how I choose the Capella module and the Doors module, how I choose how I want the synchronization to be done. And also uh, the last thing is to edit the requirement uh, and, and see how, how that uh, affects this. So let's go for this. And this is the last uh, demo video I have. So here I have a logical structure again. I have a set of requirements and now I'm opening up the synchronizer. So here I have to, to select the sides, okay? Which is, which are the modules I want to, to connect to? Of course, I can, can connect to uh, different modules and I can have uh, uh, the possibility to, to show, uh, to, uh, sorry, to, to decide what is the master and what is the, the, the slave in this, this situation. Um, and here I, I'm just showing you that that we have different modules in in the doors in our door setting, and that's basically what we are are uh, connect uh, deciding what to connect to here. So we are choosing that that module, and we are choosing the the, the logical architecture uh, module as well. So let's see what happens when we just upload the information from from both sides this is the first time i open this up so it will take a little bit time here uh, when you have done this the first time the second time will will be quicker now we will see that that we will see that we have requirements in the doors database but they are not present yet in the in the module itself or in the model itself. So I can say that I want to, to create items in site two, which is the model, but I don't want to have everything in here. Okay, so I press okay. And there I have the, the requirements in the model as well. And of course I can, I can want to have one of those in the model itself. And that's just because I want to show you what what happens when we edit this requirement. So we want to edit it. We find out now when we are in Capella that it's it's actually not not what what we want. Uh, first of all, it's not good quality because it says could. We are only accepting shall. So we are fixing that problem. And then it shouldn't be 450 grams, it should be 600 grams. Okay, fair enough. So now the, the requirements is updated. Yeah, sorry, I forgot also to detect the link here. So let's have it linked as well. That's nice. So thank you for that. Now we have an uh, updated requirement with a uh, new content, 600 grams instead of 450. And now we want to synchronize this as well. We're not changing this one. It's the correct setting. Yeah, sorry. What we want to do now is to indicate that the master is side two actually. And here you see that, that the content in the doors module is not the same as the content in, in Capella. So we want to say that we just want to update that one. Update using site two. So we are using that information. We will now store it in doors. And just for sake of it, I want to show you that it actually is true that we have the, the new information with the link inside doors. So that was all.
And what I just wanted to, to say, this synchronization, uh, for the sake of this demo, it's we are synchronizing uh, between Doors and Capella, but we can synchronize to many other sources uh, if, if needed. So this was just an example. And that was the end. And before we take a, a short uh, Q&A uh, session, uh, those of you that want to know more about requirements quality and, and the INCOSA rules and how you should write requirements using our technique for, for having a complete, consistent and correct requirements, you can apply for, for this, uh, this webinar, which is held in May 18th or 20th for requirements quality for beginners. And also, I recommended you to go to our YouTube channel to look for more videos. Uh, especially about knowledge management and how you could uh, uh, actually uh, be better on traceability. So go for that. And now for some short uh, Q and A's. We have a couple of minutes. Jose, have we received anything on the chat? Uh, yes, thank you very much for your presentation, Kirster. Um, feel free everyone to, to write down your questions in the chat box. Uh, and remember to address uh, either uh, to the reuse company or to everyone directly. Okay. Uh, so we have a question from uh, Jan Log uh, Marty, uh, and it says uh, the following: When you want to connect uh, with a SysML tool with a specific profile, is it possible to take into account the profile in KM? Oh, that was a quite tricky question. Uh, I'm not sure that I understood it correctly the the profiling km you mean that we actually have content in km already uh, what we do here is that we actually say say, say that uh, uh, it overwrites or complements the information in km so we are saying that the master here is the capital model uh, so you, you i don't remember if you saw that but most of them were 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 locked they were indicated that they were locked but some of them weren't and and that information was actually already present in km and then you can edit it because it's it's already already in there but if it's not the master is in capella okay think, thank you yeah. for the answer Christopher. um i don't think we have uh, any further questions uh, but um if you want uh, to wait uh, a little bit and, and okay, we have one more uh, from Semberly. Um, how do you ensure requirements traceability between system and subsystem requirements? Uh, I would say that that's that's an issue of how you are actually writing your requirements and how you are managing the the, the requirements project in doors first of all. You have to do this this uh, uh, allocation of requirements in in typical way, and of course the modeling side needs to capture that and needs to be in line with that. So you have systems, subsystems, components, and so on and so forth. Um, so they they need to be hand in hand. So the the iterative approach is is of course good because otherwise you could soon see that you you don't have the same schema when you you are. are actually uh, degrading your system or, or breaking it down to its its uh, smaller pieces. So, uh, by, but by having the possibility to actually do this connection, you will see that you are starting to, you know, lose the, the connection, the, the, the communication bet between the requirements authors and the architects uh, by, by doing this. So, it's, it's all about talking to each other, I would say. Thank you, Christopher. Um, I think for now we don't have any further questions, so uh, we can conclude it here. Uh, thank you very much for, for attending. You can find recordings from other webinars and videos on our YouTube channel, as Christopher mentioned, a code that we use company. And of course, if you have any additional questions or you want to receive more information, please don't hesitate to contact us by email uh, to contact at reusecompany.com or through our website, www.reusecompany.com. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.